Now, last week, this, uh, this morning, uh, we were supposed to focus on live groups. That's why you see, you watch those videos. And, uh, but I want to do it a little bit different today. I want to do it through the study of Ezra. You may be thinking, how do you do that? All right, now let's look into it. So, um, like I shared earlier, that uh, earlier this year, when God gave uh, me the, the theme for the church, review, restore, renew. What's the theme of the church? Can you re- uh, repeat after me? All right, one, two, three. Review, restore, renew. All right? So he directed me to uh, Ezra and Haggai. They are contemporaries, which I will share shortly. And uh, so, why Ezra? I'm going to give you the introduction this morning. It's a very, in fact, Ezra and Haggai, uh, most churches that I know of, in fact, uh, very seldom you hear people actually uh, study Ezra and Haggai. In fact, you might be asking me, where is Ezra and Haggai, right? Uh, nowadays, with your app, you can easily search. If I give you a Bible, you don't know where is it exactly. Am I right? All right. So, uh, is there? Is there? All right. If you have a physical Bible like me, is there? And the page is um, 456 on my Bible, in my Bible. All right. So now, so I'm gonna, so we're going to study the principles and the spiritual impact. How I, I trust me, guarantee that you will be blessed for your personal life, for your family, for your career, even for our church, as we draw really biblical principles of what God wants to speak to us and teach us from uh, Ezra and uh, Haggai. All right, so let me give you a little bit of history to begin with. Now, because of King Solomon's idolatry, you know, King Solomon's was really, you know, uh, the worst king ever talked about when it comes to idolatry. God judged Israel and he divided their kingdom into two the northern and the southern. So the northern kingdom, 10 tribes of Israel in the northern kingdom, and the southern kingdom, which is the, the other two tribes of Israel, Judah and Benjamin. And so, but all, both kingdoms, all 12 tribes, spiritually, they were quite terrible already, but they really went from bad to worse. And so God, really, He used His prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, prophesied that they will be judged. Now, when God, you see, when we sin, right, and we think that it's okay, God is just being patient with you. He's just waiting for the time. He, he will not let sin escape without disciplining and judging, including those who are non-believers, wicked people. Think, why is so wicked? Why is so wicked? Wait, lah, wait. God has His timing. The more sin you collect, the bigger the slap that God will give you on your face. So keep your account short. And so these guys, this is God's own people, you know, and God will not spare them from discipline. So God judged them, and the northern ten tribes were invaded and captured by uh, the Assyrians in 722 uh, BC before Christ. All right. And in 605 BC to 586 BC, the southern, which is Judah and Benjamin, they were captured by the Babylonians. And it's been prophesied by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6 and chapter 11 of Isaiah, which you can read yourself, where King Nebuchadnezzar of uh, Babylon destroyed and flattened Jerusalem and the house of God completely. It was left in ruins. And Jeremiah 25 and Jer- Jeremiah 29, praise the Lord. God did not stop there. He promised that He will restore His people. He will restore Jerusalem after 70 years of exile. They have been captured by Babylonians, all right, by the Babylonians. And He did. Otherwise, we won't be here today, all right, to talk about uh, Israel. Israel won't be here today. And He did. Now, Ezra has a contemporary called Nehemiah, which we know that, right? Ezra rebuilt, not just Ezra, we will learn about it later, but in Ezra, it was written of the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah was in charge of rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And in the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew Bible, Nehemiah and Ezra is considered one book. So they are contemporary. Because they recorded historical um, incidences, happenings, the whole process of the returning and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. There are two prophets 
which are very important prophets during the whole process of rebuilding and restoring, uh, is Haggai and Zechariah. So Haggai um, is a contemporary of Ezra, and Ze Zechariah is something else talking about the future uh, Jerusalem and church for the people of God. Now, we are going to focus on just Ezra and Haggai because they are related to the rebuilding of the house of God. Now, I want to say something here. Rebuilding of the house of God and the city of God must be so important to God that He paid so much attention to it, which means we cannot take it lightly. It was not the Jews. It was not the Judah or Benjamin tribe and say, let's go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. No, it's not that. It was God who initiated it, God who promised it, and God who did it. And when God did that, it is not just about the city and the temple, but it's about rebuilding His people. What's the point of rebuilding a temple and a city when there will not be any people populating it? There will not be any people serving him in the house of God he rebuilt it. What's the point of doing that? It is not about the temple, physical. It's not about the city. It's about his people, his nation. His, he put them in this city called Jerusalem and a temple for his people to bless them. That's exactly the promise that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ultimately, God's main purpose is not the physical city or the building, but He is into res restoring His people, including you, including me. Amen? God is into restoring His people. God is into reviving His people. God is into rebuilding His people. It's more than beyond just the bricks and the stones. Aren't you glad? So it is not me, Daniel Tan, who wants to rebuild the church. It is God who has spoken and I just join Him. And I'm going to invite you to join me. So in chapter 1 to chapter 6, there are 10 chapters of Ezra. I'll give you an introduction before I give you the points. Uh, so by the way, I want to speak to you about this morning. God is restoring His people. Everybody say, God is restoring His people. Come on, I can't hear you, including those of you at home as well. Though I can't hear you, you hear yourself speaking. One, two, three. God is restoring His people. Who is God's people? Come on. Who is God's people? Okay, you're not sure. Who is God's people? Who, who are the people of God? Any people of God here in the house? All right, all right. Ask your friend next to you. Do you belong to God? All right. Okay, so then it's you. Say, tell your friend next to you. He's talking about you this morning. Come on, tell your friend he's talking about you this morning. I know you're quite far away, you can just speak, or I can't see each other's mouth. It's not going to be this morning. Yeah, there are 10 chapters in Ezra. Chapter 1 to chapter 6 recorded the first return of the people of God, 50,000 of them, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, 538 BC, and it was led by Jerubbabel. Interestingly, who is Jerubbabel? All right, I don't have to read. Some people read Jerubbabel, some people read Jerubbabel. Yeah, Jerub. All right, let's call him Jerub. So Jerub is a descendant of King David. Now, why is that important? Follow me, all right? Then in chapter 7 to chapter 10, it was a second return led by Ezra, 458 BC. And interestingly, Ezra is a descendant of Aaron the priest, the high priest. You know that, right? Okay, remember we studied Exodus? You've learned that? And why so unique, God called a descendant of King David, followed by calling the descendant of Aaron, these two. So he's a second written, let the second written back, and we will study what did Ezra do was so important. Amazing man of God. We're going to study that, all right? See, friends, when God is restoring his people, number one, he calls kings and priests. God is calling kings and priests. He did not call carpenters. Hello? He did not call a contractor to lead. How many of you want to build your house? You're going to look for Agong? I mean, he can pay for your bills. Huh? But he said, Agong, can you help me to draw the, the plans? The, you, know? you don't ask a king, descendants, who has no experience in carpenting work in building whatever build, buildings to, re, 
to build something, to lead a team back to build something. But there must be something so special about kings and priests. You see, when God wants to restore His people, He calls kings and priests. In the work of restoration, we, know, we need both the kings and the priests. Kings builds and rebuilds. Who are kings? Kings are the ones, businessmen like today. That means you are the one who governs, who rules. You are cle- you're good in organizing. You're good in processes, administering. Maybe if I put it more in the today, 21st century, you're very IT tech savvy. It probably takes me 10 steps to press a button. It takes you half a step to press a button, same button. You know what I'm saying? So kings have certain gifts that priests don't have. You, you, you are like strategies. You are like managers. You are professionals. You are the, you are the one who make money. You know what I'm saying or not? So God is calling people like that. And the priests, what are their roles? They give spiritual leadership. And God, God wants both kings and priests to work together. To begin with, our leader, you must come back to first, huh? who leads us? Jesus is our leader. He is a king of kings. He is a great high priest. And we are the, his control, little priests and little kings that working together with Jesus. You know something, friends, I always say it's a privilege to be called by God. It's a privilege. Don't make it a big deal. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you all know the verse that we have been called to be kingdom of priests. I preached that last year. Together, we make kingdom of priests serving our king of kings and our great high priests. You know, a simple example for myself you know, and myself, when, when God calls us to, to missions, some of those of you know that, we go Sarawak missions. You know, the thing about missions is that you can't do it alone. You need partners. And God, in His faithfulness, He sent us kings to partner with us. And that is why our missions was, of course, not without challenges, but it was like more, in fact, it is, it is smoother. It is more enjoyable because God sent kings to partner with us while we're doing the priestly work. Even our church, back in the crimson here, and God sent kings to supply, to provide, to build together. Even Trono and Lumo, the same. I mean, how are we going to do this kind of work if God don't send kings to supply, to build together? Even I'm so appreciative of some of you, like open your house for life groups. In fact, some of you say that I, we can't do life groups in our house because we have to like Zoom plan. That's why we want to encourage you to do smaller life groups, like three or four of five people, we have a term called nano here, nano, small. The, the, now we have to, the bigger we are, we have to grow the smaller. So that you, you, can, you can even do it in, over a coffee place that's quiet, you know. You don't have to do it in a house. You can do it in a house when it's small, but don't, just make sure you have social distance, you know. Better than doing it through Zoom. And so you open your house. And is there anything I want to tell you? First week, first Saturday of next month, that is... The sixth, is I'm wrong. No, the fifth. All right? We are starting our teens ministry. All right? And I'm so thankful we have people, couples in our ministry open their house to host. We have small group of teenagers so they can host it in the house. They have a big house. All right? They have to like intercom each other in the house to... No, no I'm just kidding. All right? So, so what I'm saying is I'm thankful for kings like that. Even in the house of God, some of you are so clever in computers, in sound, in music, in whatever, in even arranging a chair so perfectly lined up. You see, there's no crooked line in the chair. Some people just so detailed. You ask me a range, uh, you know, you ask my wife, you know. All right, and so what I'm saying is, kings, God is calling. And we need kings and priests working together to advance the church of God, to advance the kingdom of God, and God is calling us, God is inviting us, and it is a privilege. Amen? Ezra chapter 1, let's turn to it. Let me read from verse 1 to 4. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, 
in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build a temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where su survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, verse 1 is the key here. Let's go back to verse 1. He says, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Now, this is a very powerful introduction here. So the first thing I say, God is restoring his people. That's why he is calling kings and priests. And we here wants to be the kings that God calls you. Yes, you want to be kings. So we play as a pastor, we play the role as a priest. And you are the kings. The second thing, when God is restoring his people, I want you to remember this. God is always faithful to his words. Remember, look at the word always. God is always faithful to his words. God will, not, God, will, God will always do what he said he would do. In his perfect time, not our preferred time. Hello? Think about it for a while. In his perfect time, not our preferred time. We can't stand it when things are going slower. So we want to be faster than God, right? Because we are living in an instant gratification generation. Now, God is always faithful to His words, not our words, not our ones, but His. With or without us, better with us, God will still fulfill His words. Sadly, some people, they chose to walk away from God's promises. Joshua 23, 24, I love this verse. This is towards the end of Joshua's life. So when you are almost dying already, you know, imagine, uh, I'm not saying you're dying, I'm not cursing you. You're almost at your last breath. What will be the nice things, what will be the something you say? You won't be asking for McDonald's, that, that's crazy. You won't be asking, I don't know what you're asking for. No, I mean, uh, can I eat durian before I die? Hello? Look at what Joshua said. He said this to his people. Not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Not one. Every promise, every has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. He has to repeat it twice to remind the people of Israel. Remember, Joshua is the second generation after Moses when that entire generation died in the wilderness. 40 years, they were just touring around. They call it the longest funeral march on planet Earth because they were just waiting to die after 40 years in the wilderness and then a new generation comes up. They missed it. Joshua generation, they experienced the promises of God and that's why he can say, not one. Not one. You see, you can't say this verse if you walked away from the promises of God. You can't. You got nothing to say. You see? So God, first of all, He is faithful to His covenant He gave Abraham. This is about God's covenant with Abraham. See, the Jews, they have broken the covenant. Go to the next slide. The, God is faithful to His covenant that He gave Abraham. See, the Jews... They have broken a covenant. I mean, the Israelites, you know that, right? But God remained faithful. So those who walked out, they rebelled, they missed it. You see, people who are living by God's promises will understand God's perfect will and God's perfect time. Can I repeat that? 
People who live by God's promises. Every day you wake up, is I'm alive today because of God's promises and I have hope in God's promises. When you live your life in a center and by God's promises, you will always understand God's perfect time and God's perfect will. He promised Abraham. Well, you read the story from Genesis one problems after another problems, as if actually, even from Abraham himself, as if God promised will be, will be like, fail. Man may fail, but God promises remain because he's faithful to his words. So whether you are in it or you're out of it, whether you are with God or you're not with God, as far as God's concerned, he will still do what he will do. We will miss it. If you walk out. And God, to us, He is faithful to the cross of His Son that He gave us all. God is faithful to the cross of His Son, Jesus Christ, that He gave us all. Sometimes we ask God, God, why are you not doing this? No, 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 wait, wait, wait. God is faithful to the cross. If, not God, if God is not faithful to what Jesus has done on the cross, today, uh, we will have zapped by lightning already, you know. How many of you think you are, we, are so worked, we are so good uh, that God should not zap us with lightning? Come on. Anybody here? Don't raise your hands. You will get zapped. And why? It's all because what Jesus has done on our cross. He is faithful to that. Be thankful for that, friends. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 says, God is faithful, amen, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wow, God is faithful, but don't stop there. It's a comma who has called you. God, who is faithful, called us for what? Into the koinonia, fellowship with His Son. Means when, if all of us is in fellowship with the Son, all of us are in fellowship together as a koinonia. All right? And but the thing is, they want Jesus, but they don't want the koinonia. There are some people like that. Friends, don't take for granted. God is faithful to His Son, the cross of His Son. Call us into fellowship. The moment we walk out of the koinonia, we don't want to belong to the fellowship, it means we are walking out from the promises of the cross of Jesus Christ. Whether you are interested to join God's restoring His people or not, He will still do it. You know the problem why some people want to walk out from God's promises? Because people become very ungrateful. Have you met people who are ungrateful before? Well, most of your heads like that. Some of you don't not because hey, you're talking about me, Pastor. Oh, hey, okay. we, 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 you know, it's, you see, if, let me tell you something. How many of you here you are from Sabah, Sarawak, Anak Borneo, Lambat Tangan? Do you know something? Let me tell you something. If not because of the gospels of Jesus Christ that was brought into your, to your people, to your tribes by the missionaries that God sent, far away they come from their countries. Today, probably, likelihood, majority of you will still be praying to the dogs and the cats and the trees and the, I don't know what, enemies. Right? we totally forgotten about how good God is who brought the gospel to save our tribe. Pastor Wagner will know he's a Lumbawang. How many of you Lumbawang here? Raise your hands, please. Raja Brook. If you have read the book, Drunk Before Done. Raja Brook. You know what's Raja Brook, right? He said, this tribe is a lost cause. No hope. Because they drunk before dawn, they're almost extinct. If not because of the gospel, well, what is Lumbawang today? But do you know Lumbawangs today, amongst all the tribes, produce one of the most, in terms of ratio, uh, pastors, evangelists. Small tribe is considered the uh, Ulu, Ulu tribe. Ulu tribe means very small, compared to Ibans, it's very big. But in ratio, uh, they produce one of the most pastors, evangelists. Is it because we are clever? It's all because of God's faithfulness. And sometimes we forget about that. We become a very forgetful generation like the Israelites. 
We forget God's goodness, especially when we become successful. You know, I don't know how you spend your challenge New Year. Okay, some of you don't celebrate, you probably like. Uh, my wife and I, we eat, sleep, eat, sleep, eat, sleep. No, okay, it's okay. okay. Part of it, part of it, part of it. We just eat, all right? Eat. It's eating time, Chinese New Year. All right, you balik kampong also, you eat, all right? Especially Christmas. All right, it's time to gain weight. Now, one of those things I was just uh, over the Chinese New Year, I was just chatting with some, some friends, some pastors, senior pastors uh, who have like way more experience and years of experience than me. And I was chatting this with this one that all of you know him. You know, I won't say his name. All of you know him, yeah. And so, and he was sharing with me, he said, you know, just over the whole pandemic, right? Many things have happened you know, in this church. And one of those things that is most um, really heartbreaking for him is like people becoming ungrateful and one particular couple uh, in his leadership. And, you know, they came as a student to his church. Disciple them, grow them, do PMC for them, marry them, see them give birth, bless their children, help them through, stay in their house. You name it, seeing them growing up. All right? It's like, Treating them as close as treating his own children. Just left like that. I said, why, Pastor? Just left. Unrealistic expectations. They were expecting something that is unrealistic from him, from his wife. I said, and then he said, yeah, I've been treating all this. This is the most heartbreaking when you have given so much, so, so much into, into them and they've forgotten everything else just because you can't meet their unrealistic expectations. You know, very difficult to be a pastor. You have three kids. Three kids expect something from you. Three only. I have 300. Praise the Lord. Only 300. Think about those 3,000. And this church is very big. It's about 1,005 more Bribon than that. This friend of mine. I say, I say, I don't know. Talk all you want to talk, but just like that. Lah. Have you done any? But no, this is an amazing. I, I tell you his name. You know, he's an amazing man of God. Why? Unrealistic. They forget. Just like the nine lepers, I told you the story. Like Jesus they forgot. You know, if anything this pandemic has done right, it's like what happened in the, uh, the, the Israelites with the Red Sea and the wilderness in Exodus. All those experiences that they had, right, actually reveals the real sickness in their hearts. Well, you walk out, but God will still fulfill His promises for His people and He did. It is God who birthed forth the vision of our church in SIB life and He has never stopped ever since from day one showing us how faithful He is. If I start telling you a story, there's so many of them. That's why you have to come for 10 foundations of life to hear all this. The hand, the gracious hand of God upon our church and He still is. Yes. But some people choose to walk out. You see, it is all because of God's faithfulness. You know, when I look back, all my ministries, I think coming to 20 years, close to that now, full time, and even how we answered God's calling to be missionaries to, those of you know our backgrounds, right? We, we could have been something else, like bigger, but it's answering God's calling. And you know something? It's not because that we are good. It's not because of the people we are serving. We do this because of God's faithfulness. I've got nothing to sing about except great is thy faithfulness. Is the task difficult? Very difficult. But God is faithful. Amen? Amen? You know, I like Oswald Chambers. How many of you know this guy? He's, uh, we are not his age, by the way. You look at the year. 
a very famous evangelist of the 1920th century. And if you want to be blessed by, you know, having very powerful devotions, go and get his devotional book, uh, My Utmost for His Highest. You can buy it anyway. You can even download it. And in one of those devotions, he wrote this line. He said, thank God he gives us difficult things to do. Nobody likes difficult things to do. One. Anybody here, you, call, you, you will talk to your teacher, a lecturer, and say, uh, why are your question exam so easy? One? Give me the more difficult one. Uh. Anybody here? Any, anybody? Like, you, go to, you do your exam paper question, so easy. You know, then you, I don't want to do it already. Go to your teacher and say, can you make your questions more difficult? Uh? Hello? How many of you want difficult? You enjoy difficult life. How many of you enjoy difficult spouse? Mm, yeah, there are some of you laughing. How many of you enjoy difficult children? Pastor Wagner? No? How many of you enjoy difficult workers, difficult staff? How many of you, how many of you enjoy difficult life? But he said what? And you got to read his biography. I mean, he's an amazing man of God. He goes through many hardships in his life. And people remember him because of the amazing, I'm telling you, I, I can't start st- talking about his story. You know, you know what he said? Thank God he gives us difficult things to do. Why? Because it is through the difficult things that we grow to trust God more. We grow to seek Him more. We grow in our faith. We grow in experiencing God's faithfulness and God's power. If it's easy, you don't need God. That's why Hudson Taylor, you know, my favorite missionaries. You walk out from here, you can see the the poster out there. It's always been day one we have been having this poster to remind us, he said this, you must go forward on your knees. You want to go forward? Always on your knees. You know, to rebuild the temple is a huge task. He said, you rebuild Nima? No, 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 no. To journey back from Babylon to Jerusalem is 1,500 kilometers walking on foot, 50,000 people. We are not talking about 15 or 150 kilometers. 1,500, not by Asia or MAS. Hello? And they have to walk through the hills and the terrains and the valleys and the, you know, and under the hot sun. And they were bandits at that time. Journey four months. You only flew two hours back to Sabah, Sarawak. This is four months. It's tough. Who want to ask for such a work? But hey, God is faithful. Amen? That's why even he makes, this is amazing, he makes Cyrus return the things belonging to the Jews. Now, let's read verse 4. What do you say? And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with gold, goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God. In other words, he commands anybody, I want you to give. He makes sure he's provided. And verse 7, what he says, Moreover, King Cyrus himself brought out the articles belonging to the temple to the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar, from Babi- of course the Babylonian king, because King Cyrus is Persian, he captured Babylonian. The first year itself when King Cyrus captured Babylonian, Babylonian, Babylon, all right, he commanded this. Whatever King Nebuchadnezzar has taken from the temple of God, return it, return it, bring it back. See, God has promised this in Jeremiah. Prophet Jeremiah has prophesied this and God fulfilled it. He is faithful to his words that whatever the enemy has robbed from you today, God is going to return back to you, double, triple, many folds. Amen. But that depends what you want these things for. For yourself or does it belong to God? You see, God will return to us what belongs to him. That means when we treat our lives as we are just a steward of what God has given to us, everything belongs to God, God will make sure it returns to us. But we, we hold it, no, it's mine. What would God want to return to you for? God has no problem in open the floodgates of heaven and just pour out blessings upon us. We are the one who has problem to open our hands or not. We come into the world, babies. No? How many of you mothers here? 
you know, babies born like that, right? Their hands, no? Do you know babies always hold their hands, one? No, you, hello? You forgot you were a baby before. He said, Pastor, when I'm a baby, I, know, I don't know, my hands close or open, all right? You see babies open or close their hands? My, 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 my. You hungry? A bit slower to feed you. Correct or not? If you can jump, you don't think you will jump and say, why so late? When is lunch, you know? It's a problem. And praise the Lord, the Israelites did not bring back to their own house the things of God. They brought it to the house of God. If you read on, if you study on, they were blessed in return. Abundantly. God is faithful to His word. When He said He will restore His people, He will also restore their fortunes. Everything. Anybody want God to restore your life? Come on, restore your family, restore your fortune. Yes, amen. And lastly, when God restores His people, God is stirring hearts that are willing to be stirred. In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, it says here, what did the Lord do? He moved the heart of Cyrus. The word moved is stir up. Some uh, translations, stir up. Because that's exactly what it means. This is move. You move the chair. Hmm. But the actual meaning is stir up. It means awaken, to awake. Give you an analogy. When I was in my school days, alarm clock doesn't work for me. And my mother will come to my room and my mother start knocking first. Ozo never worked for me. And then he will open the door. He makes sure I don't lock the door. Otherwise, I will miss school. Then he will, wake, he will use his voice first. Her voice first. She will, she will shout, He's an la! Okay. okay, in Chinese. Huh? What do you do? Cover with the blanket. After a few more minutes, pull the blanket after a few more minutes, she will push. After a few more minutes, still don't. Later, you know. Pull, like what else? How many of you experienced something like that before? Come on, be honest. Okay, wow. Carissa is the best student on planet Earth. All right. Ian, I mean, Ian pull up. <laughs> I always call him Ian. Joel is very honest. How many of you have children like that? See, see, that's what I mean. Do you know what I'm talking about? You need to be awakened. That is that word. God awakened Cyrus's heart. Let me, let me read what happened then. How did Cyrus respond in verse 2? This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judea. Pause it for a while. Cyrus is a pagan king and no record in history ever say he was a believer, worship Yahweh, but here he says it is Yahweh. The word the Lord, the word Lord here is Yahweh, Jehovah God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms I have on planet earth, appointed me to... Re wait, wait, wait. When did God speak to Cyrus, appoint him, Cyrus, build, rebuild my temple in Jerusalem. You never see that recorded that God had a conversation with Cyrus. But where did Cyrus get that from? Now, if you've trained the whole history, there's a very high likelihood what the historian says that he read about the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel about him. In Daniel, you will find already prophesied Cyrus, very clearly the name. King Cyrus. And that, I believe, made his heart ready to be stirred. The word of God came, his heart's ready. See, God can move the hearts of kings, of rulers, of premiers, of prime ministers to fulfill his kingdom plan as long as their hearts are humble, ready to be stirred, but their hearts are not ready to be stirred, even Christians themselves, unfortunately. 
we listen to the word of God more than King Cyrus. Why do we still miss it? It has got to do with the conditions of our hearts. You see, the same sun, S-U-N, that melts the ice is the same sun that hardens the clay. The sun never changes. It's a condition of the matter. The condition of our hearts. Please don't join Pharaoh's club. You know there's a club called the Pharaoh's club? I mean, yeah? Have you read that before? Come on, tell your friend, please don't join Pharaoh's club. Come on, tell your friends, please don't join Pharaoh's club. You know what Pharaoh's club? Hardened hearts. And verse 3, what did the Bible say? Cyrus, what did he say? Any of God's people. Man, I love it. Any of God's people means any. It's not the, the girl named Annie, yeah? but any one. Come on, you want to go home? Go home. And verse 5. Why don't you look at verse 5? The heads of father's household of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites and even everyone whose spirit God had stirred. Now, can I just say this? He didn't say everyone went home. Very specific. Whose spirit that God has stirred. In other words, not everybody is excited to be stirred. Some hearts cannot be stirred. That is why God called prophet Haggai, which we will study to prophesy and rebuild the people whose heart are not ready to be stirred. You see, God could have done it all by himself, rebuild the city. He could have, he created a whole entire universe. He snapped his finger. The whole Jerusalem will come back, man. The whole temple will come back. But why did he invite his people to be kings and priests? He's inviting us so that we can be blessed in the process of joining him to rebuild his house, his city, his people. Amen. To experience the mighty word of God. That's why he stirred our hearts. The question is, can your hearts be stirred by God? Can your hearts be awakened by God? And what a shame if King Cyrus, a pagan, his heart can be stirred and awakened. But you and I cannot. What a shame. And let me finish with this part here. In verse 5, we read earlier what? The heads of fathers' households. The word households here is family. It begins with the head of the family, the heart was stirred. Followed by the family. If you read on later, we will study it as we come along. The families, the, the, the tribes, the suku, were listed, grouped accordingly. You know, at that time, only the Jews were believers of, of God before the gospel came, right? But today, as we already have the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word family here is inclusive of the faith family, all of us. People who are sitting next to you. They are your faith family. We can't do restoring work by ourselves. We need God's family together. A family of God building life together. Now, how many of you have this sticker, I love life? Can you raise your hands? I love life. If you have it, raise your hands. Hi, hi, enough until I say drop it. Hi, hi, hi. Okay, now some of you don't have that. Don't worry, all right? Okay, my wife don't have, how can it be? All right, so, and, uh, so some of you don't have that, right? It's okay. So, so if you keep your hands high, all right? If you notice people sitting in front of you, back, uh, at the back of you, next to you, don't have it. Now, help me. After this, tell them, invite them to join your life group. If the age different, help the person to join the, the, the similar life group, name their age. Is that okay? All right, all right. So keep your hands up, feel still. Keep your hands up, all right? Those, no hands. If somebody sitting next to you, in front of you, say, you got to join a life group. Come on, tell somebody. That's life in life group. Come on, tell the person next to you, whoever has no, no hands raised up. Now, let me just say this. 
family, family, your groups in that. Then only you can move. Otherwise, uh, kalam kabut, no, how? It was kalam kabut. Uh, uh, kucha kachir, no. Uh, oh my, in BM come out. Uh, chaotic. Okay. okay, the Google Translate working. It's, you can't, how? That's why you have a group in that manner for that building each other. You know, let me tell you something. People who do not want to belong to the family of God, they have decided that they do not want to be a child of God. Wait, wait. Let me, okay. People who do not want to belong to a family of God, they have decided they do not want to become a child of God. If you're a child of God, you've got to belong to a family of God. They want to be a Christian, they don't want to be a child of God. Have you met people like that? Thousands of excuses. Usually, it's always about other people's shortcomings. But they can't back that with their, the Word of God. They can't say, the Word of God says, uh, you see like that, like that, that's why I don't want to join them. Lor. Come on. On the contrary, if God says love your enemies, who is it you can't love? Who is it that you can't love if God commanded us to love our enemies? Come on, tell me that. Come on. Name somebody you can't love. Except, I mean, the devil, yes. Distancing ourselves from God's family is so unchristian, is so un-Jesus. Jesus drew himself closer to the people, small groups. He always spent time in small groups. The more we distance ourselves, I warn you, the more you become critical over the church and your people and the pastor. Yeah. But then some people told me before, I'm sure you heard it before, pastor, you don't understand. My non-Christian friends are, is better, nicer than the Christians. Have you heard before? Actually, I agree, you know. But don't forget, you are also one of that Christian. Hello? Jesus had 12 disciples and they are not nice people. Go and read the gospel if you don't believe me. We forget that Jesus did not come to save the holy, but to save the unholy. The problem is not because we are not Christian enough. The problem is we do not have enough of Christ in us. And all of us still are work in progress. And those of us who are so good in judging others, they must have graduated with straight A's. Right? Come on. Hello? You see, Pastor, you don't understand. People hurt me. I don't want to be hurt anymore. Have you heard people? Have you heard that? So often, man. I don't want to be hurt anymore. Then don't love. Lah. If you want to love, get ready to get hurt. So I don't love her. The moment you say you don't love means you don't even love God. Because if you love God, you must love people. See, Pastor, I love God, but I don't love the church. What? Yeah, I love God, but I don't love the church. I leave that to you to process that. And I've heard people say this to me before. Pastor, I love God, but I don't love the church. Huh? Where, where in the Bible says that? Christ loved the church. Did you read that? The problem is we want our own version of Jesus. Let me just finish with this illustration. How many of you love to drink Milo? 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 Or cocoa? Uh, chocolate? Uh, Milo, all right? So, and maybe wake up early in the morning, kids love Milo energy, right? So let me just make some Milo for you here this morning. You know, how many of you wake up in the morning, you want to drink Milo, and so you start pouring Milo into ice. Do you drink Milo like that? Ice. But you drink Milo with hot or warm water, right? You can stir, right? Both same thing, H2O. But one has hardened. You can't be stirred. 
You started nice. Some people. Then you become so cold. And you join Frozen. You start a Frozen version 4. Siri 4. You are, what is the English word? Unstirrable, instirrable, not stirrable, whatever it is. My, my wife just taught me one new phrase this day. Stupid to the max. You wake up in the morning, you want to drink Milo, you take an ice like that and you try to stir it, you make Milo like that, it's stupid to the max. And why Christians become unchristian and unJesus Because their hearts are like that. Unstirrable. Sad. If a king, pagan king's heart can be stirred, if yours and I cannot be stirred, it's the saddest thing that you can ever have in your life. And you call yourself a child of God. But this morning, under the authority of the Word of God, my prayer is our hearts, all of us, stirrable. Amen? Come on, stand on your feet with me. Everybody, nobody is exempted, including myself. I want my hearts to be stirred. I want my hearts to, to be ready for God to work. God is restoring His people He's calling kings. He's calling priests. Will you be the kings? Some of you are called to be priests. And to know that God is faithful, always faithful to fulfill His promises, His words for our lives, for our church. You can walk out from His promises, He will still do it. We will just miss it. Most importantly, when God is restoring His people, are your hearts ready to be stirred, to be used by God? You say, yes, Pastor. I want God to stir my heart. I don't want to be like as cold as ice. I want to be like water, ready to be stirred, to be moved, awakened. So if you say yes this morning, put one hand on your heart, one hand raised to the Lord. And I want to pray right now in Jesus' name, God. You see your people responding to you this morning. Under the authority of your word, you have spoken. Just like King Cyrus, he heard the prophets, prophecies of, from Isaiah, from Jeremiah, from Prophet Daniel, and his heart ready to be stirred by you. God, we don't want to be left behind. We want to join him. Allow you to stir our hearts this morning, and we are ready to join you in your restoration work. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Come on. Let's, let the Spirit of God minister to your heart. The Word of God says, everyone whose spirit that God has stirred. And I speak that over you right now, church, that your spirit will be stirred by God.
Your spirit leads me on by the power of your love. So God, we need your spirit to lead us on. We come to you. Let our hearts be changed. Stirrable. And I proclaim to you, church, right now, when you are ready for God to stir your hearts, God is calling you and raising you up to be kings in the kingdom of God. You know what it means when you are king in the kingdom of God? You know how powerful is that? God calls kings in these last days to reign and rule with Him on this planet earth, in your workplace, in your school, in your family, in your society, wherever you are, I release that promises of God's word over your life right now. Receive that. You are kings in your workplace, in your family. You reign and rule over the principalities of darkness, of the enemy. You will not be a defeat, but you will be a victor. When you are ready to be stirred by God like King Cyrus, then you are ready to be used by God to do mighty things when He is into restoring His people, including our church here. And I release that over to you right now. Receive it, church. Come on and say thank you, Jesus. Release to you right now. Re thank Him right now. Come on, receive it and thank Him. Thank you, Jesus, for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you're restoring my life, restoring my heart. You are going to soften, melt. Yes, it was eyes, but allow the fire of the living God to melt the ice back into warm, hot water so that it is storable in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Release it! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hold me close one more time. Hold me close. Come on, sing it. Hold me close. Come on, lift your voices. Hallelujah! Come on, praise Him! Praise Him! Yes, Lord, bring me near! Bring me near! Draw me to Your side! And as we will wait, and as I wait, I'll rise up like the eagle. I will soar with you, God, and I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on by the power of your love. And I will soar with you one last time. Come on, yes, Lord. And I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on by the power of your love. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I release once again the promises of God's Word, like what Joshua said, that not one of God's promises, good promises, have failed. He fulfilled everything. Whatever God has promised you, He will surely fulfill it. In His perfect time, not your preferred time hold on to the cross of Jesus Christ every time you feel weak and want to give up hold on to that cross because Jesus said it is finished it's done hold on to that thank you Lord I release your people today with the blessings of the Lord with the promises of God's covenant over your people blessings upon blessings favor upon favor just Lord you pour out upon your people as we learn to honor you to live our life fully devoted to you and Lord Jesus thank you Lord for your koinonia your fellowship so that we are not alone we are not an island we are together with the family of God thank you we love you Jesus and all of you love you Jesus say Amen come on give a lot of praise Hallelujah Hallelujah alright Amen Amen